I've enjoyed getting to know Carlos. We had talked on the phone several times. We'd emailed several times, but I'd never met him in person until he arrived here. And uh, I, I'm proud that I can say he's my brother. Amen. Amen? I just want to pray for you tonight. Dear Lord, I pray for my friend Carlos. Give him clarity of thought. I know a series like this takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of praying. It takes a lot of thinking. It takes a strong, clear voice. And thank you for giving all those things to Carlos. And we again pray for those things tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor Ken. Uh, Maranatha. Amen. Who's excited tonight? Whew. Heavy hitting tonight. We're going to start. Uh, we're unveiling Revelation. Your life is about to change para siempre. Amen. Remember, seven presentations, you get the first DVD, the final events of Bible prophecy, 14 presentations, which I believe is Friday, right? I believe it's Friday, comes 14, you get the second DVD, uh, Cosmic Conflict, The Origin of Evil, and when you have 21 presentations, that would be the last day that we're going to be together, that's going to be next Saturday, when we finish, you get the latest DVD that Amazing Facts did, Revelation, the Bride, the Beast, and Babylon discover the hidden history of Bible prophecy. Amen? So this is going to be like the culmination of the series. This DVD gathers a lot of the things that we are talking about, and so does Final Events and, and Cosmic Conflict. So it all ravels up. Friday, 7 o'clock, Revelation reveals the Antichrist and the number 666 Part 2. Part 2 because when is Part 1? Tonight, amen, all right? So this, this topic is so abundant, it's so, uh, so needy of time because it's so big, right? And we don't want to rush through anything. We want to make sure that we understand these things completely. I mean, I can do it in one presentation, but I don't think it's fair. I think it's better if we do it in two, and that way we take our time and we really break these things down so people see what's going on, amen? So that's Friday. Remember I said that we will be running to 8.45 on that day. There are two presentations that will run to 8.45. This first one on Friday and the Mark of the Beast. Those are the two presentations that are going to move moving. After we finish with that, then we come the next day, Sabbath, amen? We're going to have our Sabbath sermon at 11 o'clock, uh, worship service, and we're going to start with the following topic. Once we unveil who the beast is, then the question is, what is the image of the beast, Amen. And that's going to be that second beast in Revelation is going to, is going to make, lift up a, an image. We're going to see that tonight. The second beast is going to lift up an image. Well, we're going to do that also. And we're going to have part one and part two. Part one is going to be at 11 o'clock uh, at our worship service. So those people that have accepted, uh, have made a, a conviction to keep the Lord's Sabbath day and join us as, as we keep the Sabbath, right? We're going to start from Friday night, actually, once the sun sets but to come with us and those that maybe have either have not made that decision or are still contemplating or just coming because they want to learn what we're learning about, then please come and join us anyway, amen, because the topic is going to be here and we're going to have lunch right after the presentation. So don't worry about that. We got you covered there. Then we return at six o'clock for that second part, Revelation reveals the image of the beast. Now, to not make it too heavy, I mentioned yesterday that this presentation, we're going to start at 6 o'clock, and it'll probably go until 6.45, so it's going to be just an extension of the, of the first topic, and then we'll have about a 15-minute break in between, and then we'll go to the second topic, which would be at 7 o'clock. It's called Babylon the Harlot and Her Abominations. We're going to go into Revelation 17 and begin to unravel the abominations of Babylon, and we're going to see a number of abominations because these abominations are the, are the ones that have the whole world drunk with the wine of her fornication. Exactly what does all this mean? But we're going to let the Bible and we're going to let the book of Revelation unravel these things. And this topic, to make it a little lighter on you, uh, we're going to go start at 7.15 and we're going to end at 8.15, okay? So that way we end a little bit early. So just in case it's heavy because you come with a Sabbath morning, Sabbath afternoon, and then uh, Sabbath night. So uh, Saturday night. So uh, I'm trying to not put the load too heavy on you. Don't worry about me. I'm keep on chugging away. That's never been an issue. So we have a big Sabbath this day coming up. Then we have Sunday. We return with one of the abominations of Babylon, one of the, abomin of the abominations of the harlot, which is the enemy's 
greatest lie revealed. This is a, one of the, sadly, most Christians have believed this lie that the enemy has, has told. And we're going to see what that lie is and how it's so important to know this lie because this lie has to do with understanding the things and the events that are going to be happening in the end time. So we need to know these things and praise God that he gives us in his word the understanding to be able to know these things and unveil them. Amen? Amen. We return on Monday with another one of the abominations, which is Revelation's eternal lake of fire, right? So the Bible says that there's a lake of fire in Revelation and that the, the devil, uh, the beast, the second prophet, which is the, which is the second beast, I'm sorry, the false prophet, which is the second beast, will be thrown into this lake of fire and so will the angels that follow Lucifer. And the question is, where is this lake of fire and how long is this lake of fire going to last? Amen? Whew. I love this topic. It's another one of the abominations. And then we come back on Tuesday for the worst of all the abominations of Babylon, which is the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast we're going to have a wonderful, amazing, fantastic study on what is the mark of the beast. We don't have to come up here and try to come up with ideas of what we want or what we think the mark of the beast is or what anybody has said on the internet or no. If the Bible warns us about these things, as we're going to see with the, but with the beast itself, if the Bible warns us about this, the Bible is going to tell us very specifically what these things are. Amen? It's not going to leave it up so we can try to come up with something and have to look on the internet to try to come up with this answer. All of our answers are in the Bible. Amen? Tonight, Amazing Facts presents, Revelation reveals the Antichrist and the number 666, part 1. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful day of life. We thank you for your blessings, for your guidance, for your patience, for your mercy, for your love for us. Because we know that we are not worthy of any of these things, but all of these things that we have received, forgiveness of sins, all of the gifts that come, our thanks to the merits and the glory of Jesus Christ. We ask you, Father, that as we continue tonight with our fascinating study into the book of Revelation, that you, your spirit can guide us to have a greater understanding of the things that are going to happen and why this is so important, Father. Guide us and be with us and take us. And we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Go with me, please, to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, which has been the foundation the foundation of this last call that God is doing to the earth before God ends with this. This is the foundation because this is what we have to study because this is what's going to be preached out to the world before the end of this world as we know it. Revelation chapter 14, we're going to start on verse... What verse? Verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation tribe tongue and people this everlasting gospel as we have mentioned every single human being before the end of this world is going to listen to hear this everlasting gospel that we have been studying and that we are going to continue to study until the end and we're going to notice that in the end times uh, as i was speaking earlier is that There are going to be two messages. One message is going to be from the beast, the Antichrist, the beast from Babylon. They're going to be sending a message out to the world. But this message that God is sending out, this message is is balancing, is contradicting this message from the beast. Amen? God has his message. The beast, Babylon, has their message. And these are going to be the two battling messages in the end time. And every single human being is going to have to make a decision, either for the beast, Babylon, the mark of the beast, or for the Lord's word, for this three angels message, and for following God's words as it is. Amen? Everybody's going to have to make a choice. Every single human being. And when you make that choice, if you make that choice for the Lord and for following God's words over other things, over tradition and over the things that are happening, then you will receive the seal of God. Amen? Amen. But if you don't, If you choose to follow and obey and worship the beast and his image and Babylon, then sadly, the Bible says that you will receive the mark of the beast. And the Bible teaches very clearly that the great majority of people that are on this earth are going to receive the mark of the beast. Don't go by the majority. Go by the word of God. Amen? And it continues to say, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship 
him or obey him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That first angel's message is calling what? Is God's call to restore, to restore and rebuild the principles that were established with Christ through his church at the beginning, through the primitive church. Those principles, those foundations of Christianity were built. But what has happened to those principles and that foundation? They have been placed aside, right? But God is saying, no mas. Until when shall the little horn continue to step on the sanctuary, Lord? Until 2,300 days, then the sanctuary, then the plan of salvation will be completely restored so that all human beings know what God's plan is for human beings. Amen? That's what we're studying. That's what we're going into. And what continues on verse number 8. And another angel said, follow and saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all of the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, why does Babylon fall? Because Babylon does not want to listen. Babylon does not want to follow. Babylon does not want to pay attention to that first angel's message. And since Babylon doesn't want to listen, Babylon wants to do her own thing. She wants to continue getting the world drunk with her wine. Babylon is going to fall. And those that are inside of Babylon, verse number 9, then a third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That's the last warning that God has. If you continue to follow Babylon, if you continue to follow the beast and his image, if that is your choice, that is fine, but know what the consequences are. Amen? God is doing this out of love. He's trying to wake us up. He's trying to wake Christians up to what is going to happen. And this is not some regional event. This is a worldwide event that is going to involve every single nation on this earth. Is everybody with me? Now let's read a little further because I want to share something with you. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark on his name. Notice what verse 12 says. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who do what? Keep the commandments of God and, have, and the what? And the faith of Jesus Christ. Notice that some people, well, what is a saint? The Bible tells us what a saint is. The patience of the saint are those who keep, the patience is the persistence, right? Those that persevere. How are the saints going to persevere through these things? Who are these saints? They're those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. If you keep your faith in Christ and put Christ first above all men, and you keep by doing that, you're keeping God's commandments, I want you to understand that you will not worship the beast, you will not worship the image, and you will not receive the mark. Amen? That's the key, and that's what it's selling here. It's saying this is this great message that is going to go out, but if you keep your faith, if you keep loyal to the Lord, if you keep Christ as your, as your only method of salvation and you keep on obeying the Lord and you keep his commandments, you shall not. Because if you follow on down, the rest of the chapter speaks about the return of Jesus Christ. Amen? So this is what we're seeing. This message is going to lead us into the end times. Now I want you please to go with me to 1 John. Go with me to 1 John, which is a little bit before Revelation, 1 John chapter 2, you have Jude, Peter, I'm sorry, Jude, and right before Jude, you have the book of John. John wrote three epistles, is that how you say it in English? Yes, three epistles after Revelation, actually, these were written after. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, everybody there? 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Three books, the number that is in front represents which one of those books. First John chapter 2 verse 18 says this, Little children, it is the what? The last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. 
Notice that, I don't know if how your Bible says, but it says the Antichrist, capital letter, and then it says, have there have been Antichrists, small, right? Why? Because, well, as we said in Greek, the word anti means much more than against. The word antichrist means the one that is in place of Christ. The one that puts himself in the place of God. And the Bible is saying there have been many that have called themselves Jesus Christ, right? We can go down a long list and there are probably a whole bunch of people right now on the earth that saying they're walking the earth and saying that they are Jesus Christ. That's nothing new. But God says, don't worry about those. Those are easy to identify. Matthew 24 tells you very clearly some of the identifying characteristics. And we're going to have one of those topics coming up uh, next week. But it says that watch out for the, the one, Antichrist that is going to come. Amen? And this is what we are going to be studying. We are going to look. And people say, well, the Antichrist was Hitler, was Stalin, was Saddam Hussein, George Bush, Barack Obama. Blah, 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 blah. You like that one, right? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. We don't have to come up here and try to come up with who we think it is. Tonight, we are going to unravel and start to bring out the characteristics that are going to identify this Antichrist. Amen? And it is so abundantly clear. I'm telling you this. The evidence is so overwhelming and abundant that there is no room for e there's no room to understand it in any other single way. Why? God gives us so much evidence throughout Scripture so that nobody can come up and say, I think that is this person. I think that is that one. And not only are the characteristics so clear, but we're going to see that the own Antichrist is going to say out of his own mouth that he is the Antichrist. That's how clear this message is. Amen? And this is the thing. What we are doing here is we are preparing for eternity, my loved ones. Because if you have made a decision for Christ, if you have turned your life over to Christ, remember, prophecy does not save you. Christ is the one that saves you. Amen? But those that love Christ will listen to what? The prophecies and the messages that he has for his people in the end times. Is everybody ready? Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10, as we saw last night, says what? Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is what? There is no other like me. God says, I put my reputation on the line. I am God and there is none like me. Says what? How does God put his reputation? Says, I'm going to prove to all of you that I am God and there is nothing else, nobody even close to who I am. How does God prove that? Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. And we saw that to a T. God says, from the beginning, I was telling you what was going to happen in the end, right? And I'm going to tell you further things that are coming to come, that are going to happen that have not yet happened. And he's talking directly to us. And he said, try me, test me to tell me if I am God. And yesterday we saw a fascinating prophecy. I call it the master key to unlocking the beast. The master key to unlocking the prophecies of Revelation is Daniel chapter 2. Amen. And we saw this fascinating prophecy that Nebuchadnezzar received the dream. And God said, and this is around the year 600 before Christ. And God was showing Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel and you and me the history of this world until the return of Jesus Christ. And he said it began with who? Who was that head of gold? Babylon, right? Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. But then he said another nation would conquer Babylon, would come after a nation of silver. And who was that nation? The Mede and the Persian army. And then he said, but another nation would come after that nation, which is a nation of bronze, which was what nation? Greece. And then he said, but another nation after Greece of bronze of iron would come and conquer that nation of bronze. And who was who? The Roman Empire, right? But it said that then at the feet, fascinating stuff, that the Roman Empire would not be conquered by anybody, but would fall apart, would break apart in pieces, would be dismantled. And it would come up to be a combination of what? where church and state was going to come together. Does everybody remember that? And that was the interpretation. And every single thing happened exactly how the prophecy pointed tens, hundreds, and thousands of years before any of this happened. God was already revealing it. Amen? Fascinating stuff. But that prophecy also said that what was going to happen, that it, this is where we are right now, right? We said, where are we in this prophecy? Because we saw that there was going to be a stone or a rock come out from where? From heaven that was going to do what? Destroy the nations of this earth. It was going to end with these nations. And we saw that this is a very general prophecy, right? But all of this, the focus is then on where? 
on the feet because that's where we are based on the timeline on that first prophecy. What's the next event based on that prophecy? The return of Jesus Christ. So the question is then, at the feet. And that's what we're going to do tonight. Tonight we're going to focus in on the toes. Amen? That's what we're doing. Because yesterday was very general. God was grabbing your attention. And God says, now I have your attention. Now I want to focus and go into those toes because that's where we are now. We're at that division. We're at that moment in history. Is everybody with me? And those feet, remember, it was part clay and part iron representing the clay was representing God's people, God's church. And the iron representing those states, those monarchies, those superpowers. And what we saw is the coming together of church and state. It said Europe would try again to come together, right, through marriages. And they have tried ever since the Roman Empire fell. Europe has tried so many ways to try to become what? That superpower again, right? They've tried, but it what? It just keeps on failing. Even now, the European Union trying to be the superpower, but they can't even get their migration situation right. They're all over the place, right? It's, it's, it's not working. Because why? Prophecy says that Europe was never again going to come together to become that superpower that it once was. It was going to break apart. Amen? And that's what prophecy is showing us. But it's showing us more than that when it says it's going to bring together church and state and we saw that the bible says very clearly god says don't put church and state together it is prohibited by the word and jesus christ said in matthew twenty two seventeen, 17 therefore render to caesar the things that are to caesar and to god the things that are god god recognizes and gives the state jurisdiction it has power we're going to see that tonight and this is going to be an underlining topic regarding all of the prophecies that we are going to be looking at God gives the state its authority, its her jurisdiction in certain areas. And, but then God says what? Don't mix both of them up. Because every time that there has not been a separation, when church and state has not been separated, where they are both in their position, what happens is that what? Persecution. Either the church tells the state what to do, in which case, if you don't follow the religion that is established you are going to be persecuted, or vice versa. The state tells the church what to do, and it stops being God's church because it's listening to the state. Either way, and present time, we have a number of nations that are under this right now that don't have separation of church and state, and what happens? Persecution. Amen? But prophecy taught and showed us that this was going to come to an end. This world as we know it is going to come to an end. Amen? And it seems that the devil is at hand. It seems that the devil is in power. But God, with last night's prophecy, said, Don't worry, my loved ones. I know exactly what's happening. I'm in control. You keep your focus on me, and I got everything solved. Amen? Remember, Saz says, You be loyal to me. You focus on me and make me first in your life, and I will deal with the consequences. Amen? Whew. But the gift is eternal life for those that are obedient and love God. Amen? Now, what we are going to do is this. We are going to go into Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 13, and Revelation chapter 17. And what we're going to be seeing is that this prophecy about the, the, the image, especially the feet, is now going to get expanded. We're going to zoom in and focus in and watch as these characteristics come up and show us exactly what is going on. We're going to see that it is, these are parallel prophecies. They're running together. God is talking about the same thing and being very repetitive so that I can't come up here and say what I think or I want this system to be. Amen? So what we're going to do today is this. We are going to extract all of these characteristics that identify and point to this beast, this antichrist. Is everybody with me? Today we're going to extract them. On Friday we're going to unravel them, unreveal them, and we're going to let history teach us. This is going to be a history lesson, basically, a quick review in world history on some of the things that are happening, and we're going to see all of this play out in a fascinating way. Now, what is the next step in this process? Go with me, please, to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 is the next, is the next step in understanding the prophecies regarding the beast. Daniel chapter 7 And we're going to start on verse number 1. If anybody needs a Bible, raise your hand if there are Bibles in the pews. If you need one, if you don't have a Bible, let us know and we will gladly give you one. Daniel chapter 7. Is everybody there? 
Amen? It says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while of his, on his bed. While he wrote down the dream telling the main facts, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. Six, after this I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. And the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night vision and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. With its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Everybody with me? Now, we know what a beast represents already in Bible prophecy. What does a beast represent? Godzilla. This big, ugly animal that's going to come out of the ocean is going to attack the world. No, what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? A nation, right? We see that right now too, right? What, is, what, is in, what, what, what animal represents the United States? An eagle, right? An eagle, right? What animal represents, for example, Russia? A bear, right? And we have a number of animals that represent different parts or different nations, and that's what God is doing. But we're not going to follow that because a dragon represents China, but we know that in the Bible, the dragon is not China. The dragon is who? Is Satan. So we have to pay attention, and we can't use that all the time. We have to let who interpret these symbols? Let the Bible interpret them, amen? Because that's what some people are doing. They're using their understanding of things to try to use them and apply them to the Bible. And that's why we have so many mistakes in people misinterpreting Bible prophecy. But we can't make mistakes with this. Because if we make a mistake with this, we might fall in that deception. Everybody with me? And we're going to see some of this as it plays out. So, I'm not going to come here and tell you, you know what? That lion, I think that that lion represents Ethiopia. Or I think that that lion represents some nation that has a lion as its representative, as the animal that represents it. No, we can't do that. Let's let the Bible tell us who represents that lion or that beast that Daniel is now seeing in his visions. Now, there are three lions in the Bible. Three lions that are named. The first lion is the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is? Jesus Christ. Amen? But then there's another, there are other verses in the Bible that says that the enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion. What? Trying to? devour but this is talking about a beast or a nation so let's let the bible tell us who is this lion or who is this beast please go with me to the book of jeremiah jeremiah is three chapters before daniel jeremiah and if you know the story of the book of jeremiah you already have an idea of who this beast is so let's let the book of jeremiah tell us because during the time of jeremiah it got very interesting jeremiah chapter four i'm sorry Jeremiah chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 5 and 7. Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 5 and 7. Amen? Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 5 through 7 say this. Declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, Blow the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together and say, Assemble yourselves and let us go into the fortified city. Stand up the standard toward Zion. Take refuge. Do not delay. For I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. The trumpet is announcing judgment has come upon Jerusalem for disobeying God, for telling God we want to do our own thing. And God says, all right, if that's what you want to do, if you want to willfully disobey my word, then God, what are we telling God? Thank you very much. Thank you for everything you've done for us. But we're going to do things our own way. And God... Steps aside, but when God steps aside because of your disobedience, because you have decided that you want to put yourself in his place and determine what's right and wrong, God steps aside, but so does his blessings and his protection. And when God's protection moved away, it says here that from the north was coming destruction. And who is that? Verse number seven. 
The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitants. Now the question is, who was that lion or that nation from the north that came and destroyed, the, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the sanctuary, and took the people captive and made the sanctuary desolate? Well, there's a number of different places where we can find it, but let's let the Bible tell us. Go to chapter 21 in Jeremiah. Go to chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse number 2. Chapter 21, this is just one of so many verses that we can give, proving and showing who this lion is, who is represented. Is everybody there? It says, Jeremiah chapter 21, verse 2, Please inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us accordingly to all his wonderful works, that the king may go away from us. And at the end of Jeremiah, it clearly says that Nebuchadnezzar sent his army into Jerusalem and they flattened, they burned Jerusalem to the ground. Now, fascinating stuff. And the lion, if you go back into Babylonian uh, uh, artistry, a lion is the predominant animal that is represented. Who is represented by this lion? The nation of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. Is everybody with me? Fascinating stuff. Did I say it? No, the Bible said it, amen? Now, let's go to that next beast or that next animal, and I'm going to tell you, uh, let's keep our fingers in Daniel, and I'm telling you because I don't do this, so I want to remember this. Let's keep our fingers in Daniel, and let's look at that second beast or that second animal, and we're going to go into verse number 5, Daniel 7, 5. Everybody with me? It says, And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said to this, thus to it, Arise and devour much flesh. Now some people will say the bear is Russia. Well, that's what the bear, that's, what, that's on a worldly standard. The question is, who is this bear? And we know that a bear is a what? Is a very big and large and powerful animal, right? But notice what it says here about the bear in the second sentence in verse 5. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in his mouth between its teeth. I have a question for you. Is there anywhere where we store in prophecy where it talks about something being raised up on one side and then that switching over? Yes or no? Yes. Yesterday we were talking, we were studying that prophecy in Daniel chapter 8, right? And it talked about what? It talked about, let's go there, Daniel chapter 8 verse 3. Keep your finger in the 7 if you want. Daniel chapter 8 verse 3. It said, 8.3, then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were what? Were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. And verse number 20 tells us exactly who was represented there. It says, the ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Medea and Persia. So when it says here that the bear was what? He was lifted up on one side. We saw that history teaches that the Medes were the dominant part of this nation that came together to be able to cover and defeat Babylonian superpower and they had to come together. And the Medes began the dominating part but as history continued to go through the Persians eventually became the dominating part of this nation. Amen? And why three teeth? Why those three ribs? Fascinating that for Mede and Persia to become the dominant superpower that it became, guess how many nations it had to conquer? Three. In 525, it, it conquered Egypt. In 539, Babylon. In 546, Libya. So that's how it came to become this superpower. Now, why a bear? Fascinating. It is estimated that the army of the Mede and the Persian army was calculated to be conservatively half a million some estimate to up to a million soldiers standing. Now, if that were the case today, it would be the third largest army in the world. And we're talking about 2, 000, more than 2,500 years ago. So this was what? This was a huge, immense army for the time. There was nothing. The history books of the time say that they looked like, like clouds were coming. It just seemed like there were so many and they would overwhelm. All of, their, all of the people that stood in their way. And that's how destructive and dis they were. 
They just destroyed everything in their way. However, they came to an end also, right? Amen. Let's look at the next beast. Verse number, verse number 6. Daniel 7, 6. Daniel 7, 6 says, And after this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. And the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So this beast or this nation has what? Four wings. Now remember, these are superpowers. And four wings, wings represent speed, velocity. So that means that this is a what? A very quick and a very swift and powerful nation. Now, it has four heads. Did we not study yesterday something about one horn coming out and that horn breaking out of this power and then four horns coming out after it also? Oh, yes, right? Go with us. Let's go to Daniel chapter 8 again. Daniel chapter 8. Go with me to Daniel chapter 8. This leper. Daniel chapter 8, verse 8. Daniel 8, 8 says, Therefore the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken. And in place of it, four notable ones, or four notable horns, came up toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, towards the glorious land. And if we jump then to verse number 21, it says, And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the who? The first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with what? Not with the power of not with its power. So after we saw that, what nation was represented? The nation of Greece. Who was that great king, that great male horn that came out? Alexander the Great, right? The most dominant. His father was the one that unified all of the tribes and all of the nations of, of the Macedonian and the empire, the Athenians and the Spartans. And they all came together. To what? To be able to combat the Mede and the Persian army, which was too big and too strong, and they had this military. And Alexander then, after his father died, someday he killed him, he became the king. And he was a master, master military tradition, and him and his generals. And they defeated that army, but Alexander died, right? And after Alexander died, his, young was, his, his kid was too small. There was a battle for that position. And guess what happened? Greece was divided into four nations, the four generals that came up on top of that battle, and those four generals. But it says there that none of them were ever what? Greater than Alexander. And that's what history teaches. Nobody ever was able. That was the epitome of the Greek empire at that moment. Is everybody with me? But we're not finished. Uh, are you noting some, noticing something? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. Who would be then the next beast or the next nation? The Roman empire my loved ones i'm just going to show you this these are parallel prophecies amen these are parallel prophecies god is showing us the same story and we're going to see this very repetitive as we go into revelation but he's giving us what more details and that's what we're seeing more details and more details you have four kingdoms four great metals and then the division of these with ten toes here we're going to see four great beasts, and the fourth beast has ten horns. Go with me, please, to Daniel chapter 7, verse number 7, because this is where it gets interesting, if it isn't already. Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. Amen? After this I saw in the night vision, and behold, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, it had huge iron teeth, it was devouring and breaking into pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. So there's something different about this fourth beast, this Roman Empire, different to the three previous ones. And it had what? Ten horns. As I was considering the horns, the ten horns, and there was another horn or a little one, a little horn coming up among them, before whom... Three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, and there, in this horn, this little horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man and mouth speaking what? Pompous words. Now let's go back to Daniel chapter 2 verse 40. And let's look at the description of that fourth metal and see how accurate Bible prophecy is trying to show us that God knows it all. Daniel chapter 2, verse 40. 
There it was the fourth beast with teeth of iron. It says here, And the fourth kingdom, Daniel 2.40, shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush what? All the others. So it's talking about the Roman Empire. And if you know your history, you know that there has not been a more dreadful, more destructive, more bloodthirsty empire to walk the face of this earth than the Roman Empire. They had no mercy on anybody. Alexander, at least when he would come to, a, to conquer a nation, if they gave up, he would try to assimilate them culturally. He just wanted the Greek influence to, to expand. To the Romans didn't care. Romans would just stomp on you and destroy you and make you slaves, and they did not care. There has never been a more bloodthirsty nation than the Roman Empire. And the cross, crucifixion, was the worst of all. The cross was not to kill you. The cross was to torture you. It was so horrific that not even Roman citizens could go through, were allowed. It was illegal to put a Roman citizen on the, on the cross. That's how dreadful and horrible it is, my loved ones. And this is what we're talking about. These are the four beasts. Those four beasts are representing the four same ones. But if you notice... There is an extension. Now, before we continue, I want to identify and let's pinpoint what a beast in prophecy is. Is everybody with me? Because there are horns, which represent powers, right? But there are beasts. And the beast we're going to see is a superpower. For example, the characteristics of a beast or a nation is that it dominates politically, economically, militarily, culturally, and technologically. These beasts are world superpower. They are the alpha of the world at that moment. Is everybody with me? They are the dominant nations. And some people say, well, why doesn't Bible prophecy talk about the Mongolian Empire or the other empire or these empires? God does not have enough time to give you a class on world history in the Bible. All right? God is just focused on what? On the salvation of his people, on taking care of his people. And that's why God takes these nations because they are the predominant ones and they are directly have an influence upon God's people. Is everybody with me? And that's what God is showing us. Now, there is no coincidence then that these four beasts and these four meadows are following and God is giving being very repetitive. But we are going to see this, that this is the focus. It is what? The feet. This is where prophecy focuses and this is where we're going. Is everybody with me? Now, there are ten, ten fingers on the feet and there are how many horns on the beast? Ten horns. But it says that that little horn, amongst those ten horns came a little horn. And that little horn unplucked what? Three of those ten horns. So how many horns do you have left? Seven from the ten original and you have the, the little horn with us. Now, the question is, when did this little horn rise? Well, if you see prophecy, how it moves, it says first you have the Roman Empire. Then you have the Roman Empire uh, uh, broke out. They broke down, right? And the western side of the Roman Empire divided into, guess how many nations? Ten nations. Fascinating stuff. The Roman Empire was being invaded on all their borders by the barbarian tribes. In the year 476 D.C., which is A.D. That's in Spanish. Después de Cristo. I didn't change that into English. I'm sorry. That's A.D. Anno Domani, the year of the Lord. In the year 476 after Christ fell the last Roman Empire, Romulus Augustus, at the hands of the Herulian general Odacred, who was constituted king of Rome. After several years of fighting between the tribes for control over the territory, the western side of the empire split and was divided into what? Into ten kingdoms, ten horns, ten fingers on the feet. Amen? And this is the map of what we would look for, right? These are these nations, the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Alemanni, the Lombards, right? And those nations are these ten nations. These are the, this was the division of the Roman Empire, the western side of the Roman Empire into ten. Now, these nations we know, Spain, England, France, Germany, Sweden, Italy, and Portugal. But what happened to the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, and the Herolites? Well, prophecy just told us that that little horn that rose up in between these ten did what? He unplucked three of those ten nations. And that's why you don't know who these three are, because they were destroyed by the little horn. Is everybody with me? So I have a question for you. That means that this little horn has to rise up after what year? The year 476, because that's when the last Roman emperor fell. Amen? And secondly, where do we have to find this little horn? In Africa? 
In the United States? In the Middle East? Where? In Western Europe. Because that's where it says the little horn came up amongst the empire after it was divided. Is everybody with me? Now we're going to see something fascinating. What the Bible is going to do now is Daniel is going to have this vision and he's going to repeat it three more times. And the three times we're going to see one very general and each time it's repeated, he's going to be shown a little bit more detail and a little bit more information. And he's going to be able to unveil and see clearly what is going on, especially with this fourth beast. And that's where the focus goes on the toes, on the ten toes or on the ten horns and that little horn who is the Antichrist who is going to come out of it. Is everybody with me? Go with me to Daniel chapter 7. Let's return to Daniel chapter 7. Don't worry, we're going to review all of this at the end before we're going to pluck it all together so we have a nice juicy summary. Daniel chapter 7 verse 15. Is everybody there? It says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me this interpretation of these things. Those, four, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even, even forever and ever. Stop right there. Very quick, very general. He says those four beasts are four what? Four kings or four kingdoms that shall arise. But what's going to happen? That they, the next God's kingdom is going to what? Overcome those kingdoms and God's kingdom is going to last for. Ever. That was a super quick, right? That was like a blurp, just a blurp. Now he's going to come back again because Daniel's like, wait a minute, I need more. Give me more. I know that already. Now I know that God is going to destroy them, but I need more. I need to know what's going to happen later. Is everybody with me? Let's go to the next verse, which is verse number uh, 19, 719. And it says here, da, 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 da. then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces, and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn, or that eleventh or little horn, which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a what? And a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days, who's the Ancient of Days? The Father came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the what? To possess the kingdom. Let's stop there. That's the next one. That's the second one. I said three more, right? So this is the next one. So now Daniel is seeing and he says, no, 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 no. Give me more. Talk to me about this fourth beast. And it said that this fourth beast then had this little horn come up amongst it, right? Amongst these other ten. And he ripped them out. He unplucked them. But it says here, very interesting, in verse number 20, that he what? He spoke pompous words. And he had a mouth which spoke pompous words whose appearance was greater than his fellows. Now the question is, this beast, and this is going to get very interesting, this fourth beast, we're going to see has five stages. How many stages? Five. And we're going to see that, guess what? We are in the fourth stage of this beef, beast, which means that we have what stage next? The last and fifth stage. Watch this. The five stages of the beast of Revelation. First, it's the Roman Empire. Second, it's the division of the Roman Empire into the ten nations of Europe. Next, that little horn comes up amongst those ten nations and unplucks three of them. We're going to see in Revelation 13, it's going to say that that little horn received a mortal wound from the sword. And it appeared to be dead. But that mortal wound we're going to see in Revelation is what? Is healed. And what does all this mean? We're going to find out exactly all of it, and we're going to see it not only through the Bible, but we're going to see it play out through history in an amazing, amazing way. Now, we are in this stage right here. This little horn received a mortal wound, 
and it appears to be dead, but we're going to see that that wound is being healed. And that little horn is about to return to the power that it had when it unplucked three of the other kingdoms. Is everybody following me? So this is the focus. Now, let's, let's hone in a little bit more on this little horn because this is the Antichrist. This little horn then says, has pompous words. And the question is, what does it mean that it has pompous words? Well, let's look fascinatingly and go to Revelation chapter 13. Go with me to Revelation chapter 13. Oh, keep your finger on Daniel. Keep your finger on Daniel. I remember. Keep your finger on Daniel until I say, let's go. Because I'm saying it, because before we go to Revelation 13, go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. I noticed my mistake. Daniel 7, 25. It says, talking about this little horn, he shall speak pompous words against who? Against the Most High. So first it says he's going to speak pompous words. Now it's saying that he's going to speak pompous words against who? About the, against God. And the real word that goes there for pompous is blasphemy. That's the real word that goes there. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Don't take your finger off of Daniel. And I'm telling you because I'm remembering. Revelation chapter 13 verse 5. Is everybody there? We're going to get to Revelation 13 in a second, but we first want to find out what are these pompous words that this little horn is speaking. Revelation 13, 5 says, And he, talking about the little horn, was given a mouth speaking great things and what? Blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Now, this little horn then, we're seeing is speaking pompous words. In Daniel 7, 25, he's speaking pompous words against God. And then in Revelation 13, 5, he's speaking pompous words against who? Against God. And he's blaspheming God, speaking pompous words. Now the question is, what is a blasphemy based on Scripture? I don't have to come here and try to interpret and understand. I want to say, well, I think that a blasphemy is this or that. We'll let the Bible tell us what are these words that this little horn is speaking against God and is blasphemy in the eyes of God. Go with me, please, to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Lucas. Luke, if you go to the New Testament, as it, some people call it, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke chapter 5, verse 21. And we'll start on verse 20. Luke 5, 20. Jesus Christ has just healed the paralytic. And it says in Luke chapter 5, verse 20, When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Amen? So what does a blasphemy represent based on what we're seeing here? A blasphemy is somebody that says that they have the power to forgive sins. Now, if I told you your sins are forgiven, that's blasphemy because who am I? I am just a man. Amen? Who is the only one that can forgive sins? First, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will what? Will forgive their sins, and heal their, heal, heal their land. Amen? God is the only one that has power to forgive sins. Why? Because Jesus Christ was the one on the cross. He died for our sins. He is the only one that can forgive our sins. Is everybody with me? Now, that's one of the blasphemies. Let's look at the next blasphemy. John chapter 10, verse 33. John chapter 10, verse 33. And it's very closely related to the one we just read. John chapter 10, verse 33. And we are going to start on verse 30. John 10, 30. Amen? I and my Father are one. What is Jesus Christ saying by that? Let's see. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. 
When Jesus said, me and the Father are one, he is saying what? We, I am God. I and the Father are one. We are divine. I am the Son. And what did they say? Blasphemy. So, what is another definition of blasphemy? Is the one who says that he is God. If I stand here and tell you, I am God. I am one with the Father. You would say, that's blasphemy because only Jesus Christ can say that and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? This is blasphemy and this is the definition. One who says he has the power to forgive sins and one who says he is God. And that's that little horn. Is everybody with me? Now let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. We haven't finished. And I made the mistake that I want, don't want you to make and I closed the book again. Daniel chapter 7. My Bible doesn't, my real Bible, which I have right here, my Spanish Bible, I need it because that's where I, I zone in. Daniel chapter 7, verse 23. Is everybody with me? Now, this is the last time that Daniel is going to zone in and focus in on this, on this beast, on this little horn. This is the fourth time. It says number 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, right? These ten horns came out of the Roman Empire. And another shall rise after them, or another king. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words, which we just saw as blasphemy, against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High. That means he is attacking God's people. Is everybody with me? And shall intend to change times and the law of God. It says, then the saint shall be given into his hands for a what? Times, times, and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion, talking about this little horn, to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall what? Shall serve and obey him. Is everybody with me? Once again, he's going through, and this time he gives us more information. He says that little horn now is not only going to speak pompous words, but he's going to attack, he's going to persecute God's people, the saints. And not only that, he's going to try to change God's times and God's law. But he's going to try to do these things, but eventually it's going to come to an end. His reign is going to end and God is going to destroy him and establish what? This everlasting kingdom. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to go back to this verse. In verse number uh, 25, the last part says, then the saints shall be given into his hands, talking about the little horn, which is the time of persecution, for a time, times, and half a time. Now the question is, what is this time, times, and half a time? Well, go with me please to Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. You can leave Daniel. We're done with Daniel chapter 7. Go with me to Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. And I'm going to send you all of these notes, all of these explanations. You're going to get all of it. You're going to have everything like I did last night. Did you receive my Daniel notes, right? All of the Daniel notes, all of the images, all of these things, you're going to have them. So you can study them and with us and break these things down. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Everybody there. It says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there for 1,000... 260 days. Time, times, half a time, 1,260 days. Look at verse 14. Verse 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Revelation chapter 12 on Sabbath morning, we are going to break this chapter down because it's going to show us who that second beast is, who we're going to talk about in a second. But once again, time times half a time, 1,260 day, uh, days, and time times and half a time, right? Now you're saying, why are you repeating this? Go with me to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 verse 5. 
I'm showing you that these are parallel prophecies we're going to see in a second. God is talking about the same thing, but he's showing it from different perspectives so that nobody can come up with their own interpretation. Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. Everybody there? Talking about the little horn. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Times, times, half a time, 1,260 days, 42 months. And what I'm going to show you is this. These three time frames are exactly the same. Times, times, and half a time is time is one year, times is two years, which makes it three, and half a time is half a year. Three and a half years. Now, three and a half years. Now, we're using the Hebrew method of calculation for the days of a month, which is 30. That's why the Hebrew calendar has 360 days in a year or 30 days in a month. Now, look at this. Time prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Three and a half years. Time, times, and half a time is three and a half years. How long is three and a half years? Well, one year is 12, two years, 24, three years is 36. Plus six, which is half a year, 42, 42 months. Three and a half years is equal to 1,260 days. If you take three, three years based on their calendar, right? That's 360 times three. That means zero times three is zero. Six times three is eight. Bring one up. Three times three is nine plus one is 10. Now you add the last six months, which is 180 days, which is half a year. And that gives you what? Zero plus zero is zero. Eight plus eight is six. Bring one up. 16, I'm sorry. One plus one is two. One. So three and a half years is how long? 1,260 days. 42 months is equal to what? 1,260 days. 42 times 30, that's the amount of days in a month. 2 times 0, 0. We know the 0. We bring the 0 down. I'm sorry. 2 times 3 is 6. 4 times 3 is 12. It's talking about the same time prophecy. It's showing it to you from different perspectives. Daniel chapter 7, Revelation chapter 12, and Revelation chapter 13. And notice this. We already know that in prophecy, a prophetic day is equal to a literal year. So it's not 1,260 days. It's 1,260 years. This little horn was given this time frame to do what? To persecute the saints and to do what it want and it prospered. It says there, right? For how long? 1,260 years. What it means is that this cannot be one human being. It's not a person. It's a system. Is everybody following me? There's a phrase in Spanish that says, for a dead king, you place another king in his place. Is everybody following me? This king dies, but the next king comes right after him. This is not a person, one person. This is an institution. Amen? Everybody following me here? Starting to get started having. So what we're seeing is that we're going to see, and especially, when did this time frame end? Well, first the question is, when did these 1,260 years begin? What happened during those 1,260 years? And what happened at the end of the 1,260 years? And on Friday, my loved ones, we are going to see with historic accuracy beyond our wildest dreams, the beginning of that day, the duration of those 1,260 years, and what happened exactly at the end, which we're going to see is when that little horn received its mortal wound. But that wound was was healed and that's where we are now we're in that stage where the wound is healing we're going to see all of this play out with astonishing fascinating so that nobody can say that these prophecies are kind of vague no everything is happening to a key this fourth kingdom the fourth this the roman empire as it's breaking down and then this little horn comes up and this little horn is in power for 1260 years if you remember in daniel chapter 8 it says that that little horn came up when we read, when we talked about judgment. And what was that little horn doing? He was trampling and stepping on what? On God's sanctuary. He was trampling and stepping on God's truths, right? And we're seeing that this little horn, where is this little horn? He's not some foreign power. Most, sadly, most Christians think that the Antichrist is some secular power that is going to come in and invade Jerusalem. And then he's going to lift up and then they're going to raise up the sanctuary again and all of this. That's the smoke screen that the devil has. The prophecies in Revelation have nothing to do with Jerusalem in the Middle East. Nothing to do. 
They're pointing to a total different area in the world, and we're going to see that on Friday. It has nothing to do over there. And it hurts me in my heart that people are taking these interpretations which are based on popular culture, not based on Scripture, to understand and think that the prophecies are going to be fulfilled there. And there's, oh, well, look at this, and all of Jerusalem and, the, and Russia and China, blah, 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 blah. Prophecy does not speak about them. And we're going to see on Friday how exact and how dangerous this belief is amongst Christians because it has everybody looking in the wrong place. We should be looking someplace else and that's what prophecy is pointing us to. Is everybody with me? And some people say, well, that little horn is Antiochus Epiphanes, right? That little horn that came up because he came up after Alexander. Well, that's wrong on a number of different reasons. First of all, it says that that little horn was going to be great. He was going to be greater than Alexander, right? Antiochus Epiphanes, which is one of the four horns that came out from the division of the, of the Greek Empire, was never greater than Alexander the Great. Never. He was a puppet to the Roman Empire. And it says that this little horn is coming up from the Roman Empire. So all of these interpretations that people are using, if you study your Bible, you'll notice that they have no foundation whatsoever. This Antichrist is coming from within the church. That's why it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, let no man deceive you by any means. Don't listen to what people are saying out there. Listen to Scripture. Follow the Word. It says because it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. Where is the apostasy? Apostasy is rebellion inside of God's church. The Antichrist is not a secular power. It's a power that comes from within the church. And it says, and the revelation of the man of sin, the son of perdition, which we said the son of perdition, there's only, only one person in the Bible that is called son of perdition. It's Judas. And where was Judas? Inside of the church. Right? He was the treasurer of the church. Be careful with the treasurers. Just kidding, Henry. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is what? Worshipped. So that he sits in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be what? Anti-Christ. He says he is God. He says he has the power of God. This is the Antichrist. It is coming within the Christian church. Is everybody with me? Now, go with me please as we continue. This is getting juicy. And I get excited and then I forget about my time. Revelation chapter 13. Go with me to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 12, we're going to have in great detail. We're going to break that chapter down Sabbath morning as we look at the second beast or the image of the beast that was going to rise, the image of the beast. Everybody there? Revelation chapter 13. I'm not even there. Yes, I am. It says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a what? A beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns, what? Ten crowns, and on his heads, a blasphemous name. What is he doing? We're jumping into Revelation, and now what? More details. Amen? Now we have the repetition of the beast. We have the ten horns, which we know what already, but now we have seven heads. And then we also have ten crowns. If those ten horns have ten crowns, that means that what are we looking at? Kings, queens, monarchies, right? These are the monarchies of Europe. This is what it's pointing to. These are those monarchies. Now, do we have to come in here and try to interpret our own thing? Let's continue to read and let's look a little bit deeper. Verse number two. Now, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now, let's stop there for a second. Did anybody catch that? Now Daniel is look, now John is looking at the beast, and he's saying, I looked and I saw this beast with ten horns, seven heads, ten crowns, and he had what? He had, he, he, the beast was like a leopard on his feet, was like the feet of a bear, I'm sorry, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Notice something. What was the, what was the pattern in Daniel? It was a... Uh, Lion, bear, a leopard, and a beast. Here, what? It's the total opposite. It's a beast that was like a lion, whose feet was like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. What's going on? We're seeing the opposite. It's an opposite. 
Now the question is why? Why is it opposite? And the answer is very simple. In Daniel, Daniel is looking what? Towards the future. Lion, bear, leopard, beast. John is where? John is captive in the beast. In the first stage in the Roman Empire. And he's looking backward. That's why he sees beast, leopard, bear, lion. Fascinating stuff, amen? They're looking at the same thing from different angles. It's fascinating stuff. And John is in the first stage of that beast. He is trapped in the Roman Empire. Is everybody with me? Now, what does the rest of these things think? Let's just review, which we did the first night. But for those that didn't come the first night, let's review. Daniel chapter 7, 23 and 17 says, The fourth beast shall be a fourth what? Kingdom on the earth. We know that. Now, it says that he had seven heads. Revelation 17, 9 says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the what? The woman sits. So those seven heads are seven mountains. Geography, my loved ones. And who's the dragon? Is it China? The dragon is China. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, my loved ones. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the, the devil and Satan, which deceives some of the world. Oh, everybody is deceived. And notice this, that this dragon, oh, I'm sorry, this beast, that we're talking about in his five stages, he's given authority by who? By the devil. The devil is using this beast to impose his will. Now, we didn't say it, and I didn't have it up there, but it said that this beast rose up from out of the what? From out of the, from the sea, from waters, rivers. What does waters, rivers, sea represent in Bible prophecy? Let's go to Revelation chapter 17, verse 5. I didn't have it up there on the screen. I'm going to put that in my notes. Revelation, I'm sorry, Revelation 7, 15. Revelation chapter 7, 15. 17, 15. I got a tongue twister. What are waters, rivers, oceans represent in Bible prophecy? Because it says that this beast came up from amongst the sea. It says the water which you saw where the harlot sits are what? Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So that means that this beast power, it fits perfectly with what we're talking about because it's rising up out of where? Out of Europe. Are there peoples, nations, multitudes, tongues? Do you have this happening in Europe? Yes. So this beast is rising up where you have this massive amount of people, kingdoms, monarchies, governments established. Everybody with me? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 7, uh, Revelation chapter 13. And continue. Revelation chapter 13, we're going to go to verse 3. Revelation 13, 3. We're going to read through this as we finish up with this. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. Then it says, now we're going to see, my loved ones, how everything is going to repeat itself. This is just going to be repetition. Why? So once again, God is repeating himself so that nobody can say, well, I think that this is this. No, 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 no. Everything has to what? Everything has to fit. You can't take one thing and isolate it. Everything is repetitive because God wants to make sure that nobody gives it their own interpretation. Verse number three. Then I saw one of his heads as if it had been what? Mortally wounded. Here is the mortal wound. And his deadly wound was healed. Now the question is, before we went, and the, all the world marveled and followed the what? The beast. Before we go on, what I want to find out, how did this beast, how did this little horn receive this mortal wound? Go down with me to Revelation chapter, i got to get in my Spanish Bible because I don't have it here. Revelation chapter 13 is going to tell us in verse number 14. Go to verse 14. It's going to tell us how this wound was received. Revelation 13 verse 14. Everybody there? And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was what? Who was wounded by the sword and lived. So this beast, right, talking about the different stages and specifically talking about the stage of the little horn, this little horn received a mortal wound by what? By the sword. Now, the Bible talks about two swords. The first sword is the word of God. Amen? 
the word of God. But we're going to see that this sword that it's talking about is not that sword. It's another sword that we're going to find out. Go with me, please, to Romans chapter 13. Let's find that other sword, and we're going to see how this all fits together in a beautiful way. Because the problem that this little horn does, and look at this. The problem that this little horn is doing is that when it says that it brings church and state together, this little horn doesn't separate church and state. All right? It doesn't do it. It doesn't listen to scripture. It does its own thing. So it has already, we're going to see both swords in control. Revelation, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 13. Everybody there? Verse number 1. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Everybody there? It says, let every soul be subject to who? To governing authorities. Who are the governing authorities? The state, the civil authority. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is, a God, he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. What is it talking about? Respect civil authority. Respect the state. God's Bible gives civil authority and gives it their jurisdiction. As Christians, we are to follow the civil laws of our country. Amen? We are to follow those laws. The Bible tells us you must follow those laws. Now pay attention to this. This is where it gets very fun. How many tables are there? How many tables are the Ten Commandments divided into? Two tables. The first commandment has to do with what? With our relationship towards God, the first four. The second table or the other six have to do with our relationship towards each other. God gives the civil authority, the state, the authority to legislate the second table. That means our relationships. And let's prove it. If you mistreat or abuse of your mother and your father, are there laws against there? Yes. Are there laws against stealing, lying, killing, fornication, and different types of adultery and different types of sexual relationships? Yes. All of them except one. Which one? Coveting. Do you know why that's not legislated? Because the capitalist system would fall apart. It's a joke. Anyway, so what we're seeing is that they're legislated. God gives the state, the civil authority, what? He gives them the jurisdiction, as we just read. You can impose, right? It says pay unto Caesar, the taxes unto Caesar. Jesus says respect and pay your taxes. But what happens? The problem is when the state gets out of the second table, out of its jurisdiction, and jumps into the first table, which it cannot go. Why? Because the state cannot tell us how to worship God. Amen? And if the state, we are to be loyal and honor the state and the civil authorities, but if in any moment the state were to try to get into the first table and try to legislate how you worship God and what God to worship, we no longer can be loyal to it because it is what? It is violating God's first table, the first four commandments. Isn't that what happened in Babylon? Daniel and the other three boys, they were in, the, they were in Nebuchadnezzar's cabinet. They were high-ranking officials in the government of Babylon. And what happened? He raised up an image and he said everybody should worship. And these four boys, these three in that case, right? They did not bow down and worship that because what happened? Nebuchadnezzar did what? He got out of his jurisdiction and he got into the first table and they said, you cannot tell us how to worship our God. And what did they say? We can no longer honor and respect you because you've gotten out of your jurisdiction and you've told us to break one of the first four commandments. And they preferred to die than to disobey God. Amen? Fascinating stuff. And this is the issue. What is happening here? The little horn says, received a mortal wound with the sword. Which sword? The civil sword. The civil fire, we are going to see that it brings church and state what? Together. 
Those are the two swords, church and state. The little horn does something that it's not supposed to do. It combines these two swords and puts them together and imposes what? It's false system of worship and persecution. And that's when this happened during the 1,260 years. We're going to see that in the exact same date, in the end of the 1,260 years, the civil authority got tired of this and gave the little horn his mortal wound. And everybody thought that what? That the little horn was dead. But prophecy says that the wound was going to heal. And the whole world was going to be in awe, which means that what? This little horn is going to recuperate what? The civil authority it had during the 1,260 years and is going to do what again? Impose its system of worship and persecute the saints or God's people. Ooh, juicy stuff. And we are going to see on Friday how everything is going to fit to a T perfect. It's going to be amazing, unbelievable. You're going to, your, your eyes are going to pop out. Let's go back to Revelation and finish this up. Revelation 13. I mean, I can go on until tomorrow just going into all of the little details. We just don't have enough time. So we're going to keep on reading and finish this up. Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. Everybody with me? And this is where it gets even more fascinating. Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. So... Talking about the whole world, it says at the end of verse number three, and the world marveled and followed the beast. So they, talking about the whole world, worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him. So by obeying the beast, you are obeying what? You are obeying the dragon, the devil. Verse number five, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's 1,260 years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy, listen to this, against God, to blaspheme God's name, his tabernacle, or his sanctuary, and what's in the sanctuary? God's plan of salvation. We're going to see on Friday that the little horn, how he has stepped on every single furniture inside of the sanctuary. The six furnitures have been trampled by the little horn, completely destroyed. Why? Because he doesn't want anybody to know how to be saved because the devil is using him. Says continue, blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Verse number seven, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given to him, notice this, over who? Over Every tribe, tongue, and nation. That same authority that he has over every tribe, tongue, and nation is what? Are the same ones listening to the opposite message, the three angels' message. Don't obey the beast. Don't worship the beast. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Amen? Amen. That means that if we have our name written in the book of life, we are not going to worship the beast. Amen? Now, does that mean that because you have your name written in there, it shows that? No. It is through Christ that we are saved. But when we love and, and, and Christ, we obey him. Amen? And we follow him, and we know that your name is written in the book of life when you are baptized by submersion and then continue to walk in the things that you have learned through Scripture. It says verse 19, if anyone has an ear, what? Anybody here has an ear? Raise your hand if you have an ear. Then this is for us. Pay attention, he's saying. It continues to say, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Who is it talking about? That little horn. He was taking the saints into captivity and he was killing them. We're going to see that the little horn was taken into captivity and he was killed also. By what? By that same sword, which is the sword of civil power or civil authority. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast or another nation or another kingdom. Woo Here's where it gets so juicy. You think that TV is fun? Look at this. This is amazing. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast 
in his presence. So different than the other beasts, these two beasts or these two kingdoms are what? They're working together now. Ooh. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he causes the earth and those who dwell on it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was what? Healed. This second beast, this second nation, which we are going to start studying on Sabbath morning, is going to create and lift the image. He is going to revive or give life back to the first beast because the first beast, what, had the deadly wound or he lost his civil power. This second beast is going to restore that civil power. He's going to give life to what appeared to be the death of that first beast or that little horn. He performs great signs so that even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That is a fascinating verse. We're going to study that when we study the, se the seven last plagues of Revelation and the battle of Armageddon. And he deceives, talking about the second beast, those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in sight of who? Of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as, as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So the second beast is going to raise an image to the first beast. And by raising that image to the first beast or to the little horn, what is he doing? He's giving him life back. He's restoring his civil power. And now he's saying, worship the first beast through the image of the beast. And what is he doing? Now the little horn is saying, now using that beast to impose his system. And it continues to say, and if you don't worship, what is going to happen? You are going to be killed as it happened during the 1260 years we are going to see on friday verse number 16 and he causes all both sm small and great rich and poor free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name here is wisdom let him who has understanding Calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is? It doesn't say that the mark of the beast is 666. It says that 666 is the number of the name of the beast. This beast or this little horn has a name. And I'm not going to even have to say it. They're going to say it themselves. It has a name, and that name is 666. Revelation 17. Let's finish quickly. Ooh, out of time. Just one more thing. Revelation chapter 17. Everybody there? 17? This is, where it gets, this, is, this is where it gets really good. Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked to me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, church and state, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. We're going to jump into this in detail on, on, on Saturday night. So he carried away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a what? And a scarlet beast with, which was full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten, ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amusement. We can continue to go, but we're going to stop because time has run out. Everybody with me? Now, let's give a summary. I'm going to send you all of this. And on Friday, we're going to bring it all out. Five stages of the beast of Revelation. First stage is the Roman Empire. Second stage is the division of the Roman Empire into ten nations or ten monarchies. Then amongst those ten rises up a little horn. That little horn unplucks three of those ten kings. Then that little horn is going to receive a mortal wound from the sword. But that mortal wound is going to be healed. What stage are we in? 
We're in the fourth stage, and we're going to see that with great accuracy. What are the characteristics? Number one, the sea, it rises up from the sea or the fourth beast. That means it rises up in Europe between peoples, multitudes, nations, and language where there is conflict or war. Number two, the little horn or that little nation comes up among them or after the ten horns in Europe. That means that this little horn or this antichrist has to come up after the year 476 uh, A.D. Once again, I put the Spanish version there. Number three, has seven heads. That means it has what? Seven hills or seven mountains. Number four, it uproots or destroys three horns or kingdom from amongst the ten of Western Europe. Number five, it is different from all the other kingdoms. Why? Because it brings together church and state. Number six, it uses purple and scarlet as we just read in Revelation 17 and has a lot of wealth because it has a cup of gold with precious stones and pearls. Number seven, this little horn seems bigger than his fellow European countries because it says he's smaller, but he dominates the other ones. Number eight, he will speak pompous words, blasphemy, a blasphemous name against God, which means he says he sits on the throne of God and he believes he is God because he believes he has the power to forgive sins. Number nine, he will make war with the saints. They shall be given into his hand until a time, times and half a time, three and a half years, 42 months, or 1,260 days, or 1,260 years. That's the time of persecution that will repeat. Will think to change times and the law of God. Number 11, he tramples on the sanctuary. That means he is trampling on God's plan of? salvation number 12 his name is a blasphemous name and is the number of a man which is six 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 number 13 he will receive a deadly wound by a sword which means that the civil power authority was taken away but number 14 that mortal wound will be healed meaning that the civil power will be restored and he will once again impose persecution will return as it did for the 1260 years but number 15, the prophecy says, he will be present until the last days and will be destroyed with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because the prophecy says that the stone, where does the stone hit? At the feet. That means that the Antichrist is at the feet. The Antichrist is going to be in place until the return of Jesus Christ. But the prophecy says that Christ will return and this will be it. Woo! I tried to do that without breathing and I almost did it. All right? This, my loved ones, there are almost 60 characteristics. We are just grabbing about 13, and you're going to see on Friday with overwhelming historical and contemporary present time events, past, present, and future, how these prophecies point to one system, one power. You will come on Friday, and if you do not know, if you know, if you know, you will be amazed. So have a good, healthy meal. And come prepared because this is going to blow your socks off. Is everybody with me? Friday we return at 7 o'clock. And what is the topic? Revelation reveals the Antichrist and the number 666 part 2. Amen? Now, this was a big heavy topic. I, I spoke as I always do a lot. So I'm going to give you a nice little study guide that's going to get, hopefully it, it, it uplifts you. And it is the keys for a happy marriage. Amen? We hear at Amazing Facts, we love marriage is the foundation of God's church, amen? And so we have one. So if you're married, we hope it helps you. If you're not married, we hope it helps you to find somebody to get married to, amen? So that it will help you and grow. But there's one promise, my lovers. We do not have to be afraid. This was an intense Bible study. You get all those notes, but I want you to remember one thing. What thing? The promise that God has for you in Isaiah 41.10. And what is that promise? Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will always help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We gave out a big copy to everybody. If you don't have it, please, there are more in the front. Place it somewhere on your, in, your, in your room, in a door where you have to see it. And every time you think you can't, every time you think your problems are bigger than your God, every time you think that your burden is too heavy to carry, look at that promise and Jesus is telling you, don't worry. I got you. Keep on going. I got your back. Amen? Praise the Lord. Okay, we'll get more if there's no more. Praise the Lord. Amen? Thank you. Thank you for being patient tonight. I, just, I get excited and I just want to keep on going, but I can't. So I'll see you on Friday night, everybody. God bless. And bring a member because if you do, we have a gift for whoever brings the most. Uh, I'm sorry. Bring a new guest. Anybody who brings a new guest. Amen?
God bless you. Take care. Pastor, pray. <laughs> he gets excited, doesn't he? And that's good. Let's just bow our heads. Dear Lord, may we always be grateful for your word. May we be grateful for the truths that are therein. If we study long enough, we'll find things that all of us have to struggle with, to look at and dig and discover your truth. And then may we be willing to stand up like those three Hebrews, not bow down to the image, but rather worship you. Dismiss us with your blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Good night.